out in the deep dark depths swim monsters beyond comprehension. They sit around drinking myths, honing their perception. When they spot an unwary creature, they will rise up fast and underneath. Surprise is their primary feature, followed closely by their teeth. I once saw such a monster strike out on the Pacific Rim. It had a whopping big spike and an evil-looking grin. It grabbed an orca and pulled it down to the abyss. You wouldn't see that in my orca, and if you could, you'd give it a miss. I saw another one out in the Atlantic. It looked like a giant bee. Its prey was getting frantic as it struggled to get free. Sailors say the stories are just a guess. They don't know what lies in store. They compare them all to Loch Ness and dismiss them as folklore. But I am a creature of the sea. I spend a lot of time out there. I know what I see, and I know the monsters of nightmare. This is West Coast Sasquatch Research. By way of this little introduction, guess who my special guest is today? None other than Adam McGear, the Vice President of the British Columbia Scientific Cryptozoology Club. That's right, the Freshwater Serpent Hunters. Please make welcome Adam McGear. Hey Adam, how are you doing? I'm good, thanks for having me, Jerry. I am very pleased to have you. I've been really looking forward to having a conversation with you. And... uh, I know that you're a technical writer. I will not attempt to explain what that is because I believe it would take a technical writer to explain what a technical writer might be. <laughs> so instead, I'll ask you, how did a technical writer get the call to be a cryptozoologist? Okay, well, yeah, uh, basically technical writing, it's like training corporate training or writing, um, sometimes writing manuals or job aids or explaining uh, computer systems um, to employees at a company. And uh, uh, truth be told, I was a cryptozoologist before I was a technical writer. Oh, okay. Because uh, I, I've been interested in cryptozoology since, you know, I was probably 10 or younger. Mm-hmm. Any particular favorite? Well, I would, you know, I would always check out books from the library and I had, you know, the Loch Ness Monster mm-hmm. and, you know, a Bigfoot and everything. Kind of the, the classics that you discover when you're when you're a kid and... I was definitely into King Kong and all those other things that you get into. And I think um, for me, it was this fascination with the possibility that there were creatures out there um, unexplained that, you know, that you could find out about um, that. That's what sparked my curiosity with subjects like Sasquatch, Ogopogo, Cabrasaurus, and ultimately led to me, becoming involved with the British Columbia Scientific Cryptozoology Club. Now tell me, Paul LeBlanc was one of the original founders of the BCSCC. Uh, He was an oceanographer, was he not, who studied Cadborosaurus for a number of years, taking reports and listening to stories and however. But wasn't it a writer from the Victoria, Victoria Daily Times who blew the lid off Caddy, so to speak? Uh, he published an article in 1993. 
I can't think of his name now, but I think he was the J.W. Burns or Cat Boris or as your Archie Wells. Archie Wells. Could, you, te- Archie Archie Wells. Wells. Could yeah. you tell me about those days? Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, you touched on, on Paul LeBlanc. I just want to say, I think uh, Paul was a really special guy. He was a co-founder of the BC Scientific Cryptozoology Club, along with John Kirk, who is still, um, you know, our, our de facto leader and uh involved in all sorts of interesting things but uh paul leblanc he lived on galliano he was a well-respected oceanographer um and he worked at ubc for a number of years he translated also a number of books because he spoke uh, many different languages and uh he was just well loved i think and unfortunately yeah he passed away in i believe 20 D19. Uh, but I had a chance to catch his presentation at the Vancouver Aquarium. Actually, he came down to do a kind of a fun talk on Cadborosaurus. Mm-hmm. And he's, you know, basically retired his sailboat, he used to, you know, mm-hmm. take his sailboat around Galliano. And he came to the mainland for a presentation on sea monsters because there was a sea monsters exhibit at the Vancouver Aquarium that we were both involved in uh of course separately and uh yeah it, it just great storyteller beyond his you know his work with the, the university um but basically the the world authority on the subject of unidentified cadbrosaurus sea serpents in british columbia well i know that they had a lot of sightings out around the gulf islands and um what a perfect place for him to have her headquarters for something like that. So I think um, Paul, along with another associate, they ended up putting forward a, a paper where they submitted a scientific name for Cadborosaurus or, you know, the unidentified sea serpent off the the Pacific coast of British Columbia. And the the name that they put forward was Cadborosaurus Wilsi, (laughs) W-I-L-L-S-I. And a lot of people, you, if you're a cryptozoology enthusiast, you might know where this name comes from. The Wilsi is a reference to, um, I believe his name is Archie Wills, of the 1930s Victoria Daily Times. Uh huh. And it was Archie Wills. He was an editor and a journalist at the Victoria Daily Times that really, um, he adopted the name Cadborosaurus and he also kind of promoted or he published obviously several articles about Cadborosaurus in the Victoria Daily Times. And at that time in um, British Columbia, it, uh, it was a little bit of an exciting time. You know, there's, uh, there's new species, lots of whales, of course, you can imagine. um, uh, But after, after, after this chap uh, published in the paper, didn't sightings sort of take off after that? I mean, old sightings and new sightings and people just wanted to talk about it more so Mm -hmm. and uh so that's why i refer to him as the jw burns of uh you know caddy (laughs) yeah yeah well i mean that's accurate you know is um and uh, i think it was in 1937 that the famous naden harbor carcass which you can Google to see a, a you know photo yeah. of this carcass that was yeah. recovered from a sperm whale. When you're talking Cadborosaurus, that a photo is basically your equivalent of the Patterson Gimlin film. Yeah, and I have seen that. I have seen that a number of times. It's uh, really amazing for sure. But tell me, you're the vice president of the British Columbia Scientific Cryptozoology Club, of which I'm also a member. Tell me, how did the club come about? How did where where did LeBlanc run into Kirk and uh, the other co-founder? And it was was it just an interest in these uh, aquatic creatures, or was there a bigger agenda? Or 
Yeah, so um, my understanding is that uh, Paul LeBlonde and John Kirk, they met together in the Vancouver area along with an, uh, another fellow, uh, his name was James or Jim Clark. And I never met mm-hmm. uh, Jim. He uh, was before my time. I was only um, in 1989. I was five years old. So I hadn't made it all the way up to British Columbia yet. But those, <laughs> the original fellows of the BCSCC uh, were Paul LeBlanc, John Kirk, and Jim Clark. And unfortunately, my understanding is that Jim Clark unfortunately passed away um the same year or the year after the bcscc was founded and that john and paul kind of committed to uh i feel like i'm describing the beatles here john paul ringo uh, <laughs> uh, yeah the, there's yeah. always there's always that guy that gets left out because you can't remember <laughs> his name he used to play <laughs> drums before ringo <laughs> peter best <laughs> yeah but, anyways uh, yeah, in 1989, that was really when they got started. And I believe through UBC and a number of different kind of uh, areas that they were they were interested in Lake Okanagan, you know, Lake Champlain, some of the, the lesser known lakes that uh, have had legends of, of lake monsters. But then also, you know, uh, Sasquatch, British Columbia being a hotbed for Sasquatch activity and research. Uh, but then around the world kind of connecting the, you know, the Russian Almas or the Australian Yowie, you know, the, the um, uh, different uh, mysterious species in, in Vietnam or um, like Orang Pendek and, mm-hmm. and that kind of thing to uh, really try to uh, add a, a little bit of a, a voice of, of kind of scientific reason and, and, uh, um, yeah, I mean, I believe at the time there was the International Cryptozoology, whatever uh, the title was, and uh, that's defunct now, I believe. So the BCSEC is probably the largest cryptozoological club or organization in the world at the moment. Yeah, I think you're talking about the International Cryptozoology um, a Club or a Symposium. And again, this was like a little bit before my my time yeah. of involvement. Yeah. The International Society of Cryptozoology. Um, it was actually a fairly well kind of attended. And um, one of its presidents was Bernard. I'm going to, I believe, mispronounce his last name, but who reminds? He is considered the you know, the father of cryptozoology and wrote a number of different books Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. on the subject. Mm -hmm. And uh, so you were saying that the club evolved into studying various cryptids, because I imagine at the beginning, it was just uh, lake serpents was uh, uh, what the club was based on when it first started. If uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, well, actually, when I joined, I uh, the first time I met John, I think, was at a Sasquatch symposium at the um, Vancouver um, Observatory, the mm-hmm. planetarium, the Vancouver Museum in Kitsilano. It was a Sasquatch symposium. It must have been 2000, I want to say maybe 2005 um it's a good you know a good uh a good while ago now that's a while yeah um yeah yeah definitely known them for about 15 years and so they had an exhibit going on there at the museum and john and there were a couple other speakers that was my first introduction to kind of like the the bc sasquatch community Uh and uh, i quickly you know i joined the bc sec and then um I think I I kind of was interested in taking over the website. Actually, I got involved in you know converting some of the older website files, and um, I wanted to make sure that the website stayed updated and accessible. So, 
uh, we established, you know, bcscc.ca and I helped to, to put it up onto like a, you know, kind of WordPress platform. And by doing that, I got to go through this huge list that, that John um, and the other members of the BCC, BCSCC are generally very detailed in their uh-huh. uh, notes. Hence, hence the insertion of uh, scientific <laughs> in the name. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So these, go ahead. Yes. Yeah, sorry. Go ahead. No, that's okay. I mean, uh, just to throw out a couple. I mean, Mokele um, Mbembe in the in uh, the Congo kind of area of Africa is, you know, it's a, a living dinosaur type creature that. Uh, you deserve uh, kudos just for being able to pronounce that. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, as I say, I, my you know my pronunciations. I I uh, apologize to any uh, native speakers of of the language, but John, um, I think, has been involved in in the search uh, for that creature. It's you know the rumor is that it's a a dinosaur like animal, and I. Um, <clears throat> I feel like it's always important to acknowledge that whenever we're, we're talking about these kind of dinosaur type creatures, if it's a sea serpent or even, you know, in the, in terms of Sasquatch, like, uh, you know, a, uh, say like an early hominid or, or relative hominid. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it's really important to acknowledge that, there are some stories that come from uh, cultures that are kind of like indigenous to the areas that these stories come from. And we, as like our culture, we try to um, make sense of or interpret older stories that, um, you know, they may or may not belong to us or they may not be we might not be able to reconcile um, some of these stories with an actual living, breathing animal. Like we may never track down the Loch Ness monster Mm -hmm. or the Mokele Mbembe. And I think, I feel like it's just really important to respect uh, cultural traditions, especially in British Columbia, um, indigenous culture, cultural traditions and the the stories of um ogopogo or lake okanagan before um settlement and and uh um uh, sasquatch as well mm-hmm. in in different um indigenous cultural traditions i wonder jerry what 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 do you think about that topic well you know i can i can identify with it uh, uh, the uh, serpents, uh, that's rather a new interest for me uh, for, for a short time now. I'm pretty well uh, immersed in the Sasquatch camp. Uh, but I understand what you're saying because of the situation with the indigenous people and uh, how difficult it is to get them to open up and speak about a, a creature like Sasquatch. And uh, I, I remember running into a chap up on Hope there on American Creek, uh, where myself and Tom Steenberg were riding along, and uh, we met him on the side of the road, and he was up there collecting stones or whatnot. And he turned out to be a hereditary chief of a band from Prince George. He was down here living in Hope at the time. And he gave us a little bit of a sermon on how to see a Sasquatch, uh, you know. Uh, you've got to be in the right frame of mind. It helps doing a sweat lodge thing beforehand. And uh, if you go out in the woods, you will see one after that. But you've got to be sort of light of heart and light of mind and be open for the experience. Well, a lot of people have the experience without doing a lot of that. But uh, that doesn't really give us any more of an understanding of the creature. Have a hard time adapting into their way of thinking about these creatures. Well, we have a more scientific approach. They have a more spiritual approach. And sometimes I think uh, their approach is, you know, to me, uh, has a more appeal to it all the time. I don't don't believe in paranormal stuff with flying saucers and Sasquatch and all of that. 
but I do believe there might be something special about these creatures, should they exist, that would explain why we have such a difficult time in finding them purposely, because most people seem to find them just totally by accident anyway. But I mean, no one wants to listen to me prattle on about this. They're here to listen to you. But uh, so I had to ask you, uh, which is your preferred crypto for study? A woodland critter or a lake monster? Well, I mean, I, I uh, like to con- consider myself, uh, like I said, a fan of the classics. And it was, you know, like the Loch Ness Monster and Bigfoot that got me into this. And um, obviously living in British Columbia, I uh, I came to know about Ogopogo and Lake Okanagan. And that's one that uh, um, John Kirk, our, our, one of the co-founders, he has spent a lot of, of time on Lake Okanagan, a lot more than I have, certainly. Um, and been involved in a number of different expeditions and um, different uh, uh, television recordings that have taken place um, around there. And uh, for me, I mean, I, I love the Okanagan as a region. We're heading up to Vernon in uh, July and looking forward to it. Might do a little spotting at the lake, but uh, I, I'm not... I wouldn't mount a Ogopogo expedition um, with uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars if I if I had that, you know, to mount an expedition with. Sasquatch, I think I could probably, um, in terms of uh, being like BC's, you know, mm-hmm. number one cryptid, I think it's pretty yeah. easy to make that to, uh, claim. Um, again, with all due respect to um indigenous traditions there are so many different areas in in bc where a uh whether or not it's recognized as sasquatch or 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 something similar is reported over the years and i think a lot of people who if you're just starting your exploration of the subject of sasquatch in british columbia it can be uh, quite mind-boggling the history of um, incidents and you know dates and pe- uh, figures and activities and Jerry, I know you have a you know a mind for um, a lot of these names. And John Kirk has a you know an extraordinary memory. And again, is a great storyteller like Paul LeBlond. Um, just hearing about some of the early figures that were involved, like uh, John Green and. Uh, Renee de Hinden and, and Bob Titmus you know, and uh, yeah 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 the you know the, the early that's really how you you know you get into the topic is to learn about the um, people who are doing the research well you see that's that's exactly what I'm doing here with these podcasts uh, I, I I don't I didn't want to start about a podcast to talk about Ogopogo or Sasquatch or whatever there's enough of those out there you know I want to talk about something that I find equally as interesting, and that's the people who do the research, because uh, that's that's been a pet project of mine for a long time now, uh, because uh, I'm like a lot of people from the old days, and the old days meaning back at the turn of the century on Bigfoot forums and such, that pretty well, you know, would puke if they had to read another encounter with Sasquatch because there's nothing new to report. (laughs) So I found that the characters out of boredom or whatever, who attended that forum, they were very interesting people from all walks of life. And uh, it's, it's sort of made me very curious about how they got into it. I know how I got into it, uh, but that's another podcast for another time. Um, as far as uh, which I would prefer, woodland critters or lake monsters, that's, uh, I don't know, would that be that hard a decision? I mean, if you got an invitation to go out on a boat on a lake for an entire day or go slogging through some midge-infested swamp up on North Harrison looking for under the small growth for a footprint, you know, which would you choose? <laughs> I think yeah, the, well. <laughs> the answer is kind of obvious, I think. <laughs> but no, uh, I mean, Squatch, uh, Squatch holds a, a, a certain place in my heart for certain. I think Jerry touched on it there. 
um, in the sense that squatching, uh, uh, as much as I hate to use that term, but Sasquatch research is hard work. Yep. And uh, our mutual colleague, uh, Thomas, who I'm sure listeners of this podcast uh, need no introduction to, uh, Thomas Steenberg, in terms of being somebody who is out in the field and, um, you know, um, uh, uh, covering ground, I know uh, you, you, you've been out there and I think um, having an interest in kind of uh, being off the beaten path is certainly a, you know, a requirement for this type of work but there's I, I you know I definitely can't claim to have spent nearly as much time out in the the true wilds of British Columbia as any of you guys have well I want to ask you how many uh, BCSEC expeditions have there been and how many have you personally gone out on uh, well I mean there were uh, obviously quite a few when I was a, a younger member and I mean I was still in school when I was when I joined the BCS um, later on I actually became involved in an investigation on Vancouver Island into a small lake it's called Cameron Lake and uh, it's between Parksville and Port Alberni yeah on the island um, and there's a lot of history around this lake uh, it's very cold, and there were reports of uh, a creature for a while there. There was like a little flurry of activity of different um, people who had been what, driving the highway. Uh, what sort of activity are we talking, Sasquatch or? Uh, no, in the in the water in the lake. Oh, okay. Um, yep. But actually, funny that you mention it. That area also has been known over the years for some Sasquatch activity. There have been Sasquatch sightings noted. Uh, along that highway that uh, basically the highway that takes you out to Port Alberni and then ultimately to Fino. Um, there's an, uh, obviously a history of Sasquatch activity around there. And also there's one of those kind of older traditional stories about the Horn Lake caves. Um, I've never heard of them from there. Uh huh. Um, Horn Lake is just north of Cameron Lake. And one of the topics that came up when we were doing our Cameron Lake kind of investigation is, is whether or not the two lakes could be networked with a, you know, a series of caves and underground kind of aquifers, aqueducts, um, under, underwater underground caverns, essentially, uh-huh. Uh-huh. because... That is the geography of that that part of Vancouver Island. It's known as, uh, I think, karst topography. A lot of uh, caverns in the. So, what's the largest expedition that you've gone on to well, this date? That, that one, surprisingly, for a for a small lake, um, ended up garnering quite a lot of attention, and uh, you know the the island news came out and there were a couple of different news channels on the day that we were doing our work on Cameron Lake. Um, I think we ended up on, you know, the local, all the local news channels and then CTV called me. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know, it was not the next day, but it was a few days after they wanted to talk about it. So it was uh, CTV Canada AM um, I was on to talk about, you know, the Cameron Lake creature. And I think people, again, um, liked the story of, you know, it's a small town. It's a mysterious lake with a lot of history. There was a, a train crash, possibly a plane crash around this lake. And um, just this kind of classic story of like a, a, a lake monster in the woods maybe got a lot of people excited. Mm. And so it was really fun for me to be a part of that and you know I was kind of you know honored to be on on camera and on tv and that's something that is kind of interesting for folks getting involved with cryptozoology is that um, you may at some point need to make a decision about you know appearing on camera or or on tv or expressing your opinion 
in a public forum, even on social media about, you know, your beliefs. Yeah, that's that stuff can come back to haunt you. <laughs> that's right. I mean, <laughs> there is so much, so much animosity and so much um, aggression, unnecessary aggression, in my opinion. And I, uh, personally, I don't participate in a lot of the uh, message boards or, or social media on the subject. No, For that well, reason, and just because there's no time. Yeah, well, you know, uh, Tuesday, the 15th, uh, I'll be putting up the podcast I did with Thomas. And we touched on that subject about, uh, yeah, the f- f- infamy of it all. <laughs> the, dealing uh, with the news, press and documentarians and stuff like that. And uh, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, that's a, that's a quite interesting subject all on its own. Hey, has the BCSCC ever teamed up with another group for an expedition like the BFRO or something like that? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I think um, in terms of the BFRO, we have partnered up over the years. Uh, Certainly, you know, our members know their members. And uh, I think uh, Jason, you know, Jason uh, Zacherson. Yes. Usually the guy that I think of. Um, I believe is, you know, BFRO affiliated, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but um, Jason is, when I think of like a intrepid kind of like BC Sasquatch researcher, like the Thomas Steenbergs of the world, I, I put Jason in that category. He's, he's uh-huh. out there. I think he's, he he's out. The, and... He's the real deal, <laughs> you could say. Yeah, well, uh, he's got the beard to show for it, too. Oh, Z- ZZ, top standing. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> because hey. I, I know Jason got a little thing on the go himself with the BF, uh, BFRO or some singular members of the BFRO, not the organization yeah. in total. As of, I don't know. Have you ever heard about the black, uh, the, 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 the black lizards in Pit Lake? Um, I, I think I may have, but I think I heard about it as black salamanders. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, and to be honest, that is a subject that is of interest to me because, um, I'm interested in, you know, uh, uh, salamanders and reptiles. And I guess going back to that, you know, childhood fascination with dinosaurs and, um, also whales, and I always like to learn about all these different creatures, but uh, salamanders are, you know, particularly interesting, and um, the way that they can, you know, they can live, I think, in, you know, uh, really damp areas or even underwater. Mm-hmm. Um, so obviously, you know, you don't see them very often. Uh, but as I've heard it, uh, there was actually a, a, a member of our group by the name of Barry, I don't know, uh, Jerry, if you remember Barry uh, Blount. Oh, he, very well, very well. Yeah, bless him. He, um, I met him at one of the one of the meetings of the BCSCC uh, over on Greenpoint. I attended one of the functions, and I met Barry there. He was very new to it all then, and went on oh, to yeah. become very good friends with him. Yeah. Anyway. Well, I just wanted to say he was one of the ones who first told me actually about the uh, black salamanders i think it was in the area of chilliwack lake and um green drop lake and yes. lindeman lake yes he was trying to figure out i believe at the time where green drop lake was i believe they changed the name to cougar lake or something and uh, anyway it sort of stymied his efforts because he had uh, he wanted to go in and visit this place he never did yeah. make it. He never did find it. <laughs> well, it is the, it is marked on the maps. There is a, a green drop lake out near uh, Chilliwack Lake. And yes. I, I, I'm not sh- sure if it's the same one or there could be a different one. But uh, I think in that region, basically, the story goes that there was like a boardwalk, a section of boardwalk, and somebody was coming along to replace the boards that had been kind of rotted away and went to pull up a section of the the uh, boards and saw what looked to be you know a four to five foot giant alligator uh-huh but that was you know dark 
darker in color. And um, when you think about, you know, dark alligators in that kind of environment, um, a giant Pacific salamander is only supposed to grow about a foot long. There is a species of giant Pacific salamander here on the West Coast that grows about a foot long. But Asian giant salamanders can grow four, five, even six feet long with the tail and head. Yes, and well, this, this coincides more along the lines of what these reports from the north end of Pitt Lake are like. They're, they're, they, they're described as the size of alligators, you know. And, uh, yeah, I've seen the, the black salamanders. I even commented on them in a past podcast uh, that except for the bulging eyes they look like little dragons they're cute <laughs> little things <laughs> yeah well i mean in in terms of an area that i think deserves further interest um if you're a, a cryptozoologist especially in the british columbia area this rumor of giant salamanders it would be really really cool if we could get you know, a picture or evidence or something of, of you know, con- confirmation of this, uh, because it would really represent a new species, a recognition of a new yeah. species in the province of British Columbia. And that's ultimately um, on the on the subject of Sasquatch or Ogopogo or Cabrosaurus or any of these. Um, you, we can debate until we're blue in the face. We can argue about, you know, what um, abilities or or um, characteristics these animals have, but ultimately we're we're not there yet. You know, we don't we don't have confirmation that these are a species, and in my opinion, we will not have confirmation until there is a you know a, a carcass. Um, the protection of those species is really. Um, conservation and appreciation is really what I think um, this should be all about. But it's hard to get government protection for a creature that you can't even prove exists, you know? It's uh, like a lot of people say, they want to, you know, have Sasquatch as a protected creature, hominid, whatever you wish to call it. Uh, but the only problem with that is that the scientific community refuses to, uh, uh, you know, refuses to go along with the idea that such yeah. a creature even exists. So you're, you're, you're sort of standing on pretty shaky ground. Well, and I think ultimately it is, you know, it's, it can be a, a, a cart before the horse kind of situation. Um, it, it is the the truth that the greater community the scientific community and the the public at large i don't think would accept the existence of you know a a a sasquatch or another creature unless there was a you know a type specimen and um when you're talking about the subject of sasquatch and these other cryptozoological creatures I think it's really important to remember, uh, you know, the basics of kind of uh, uh, biology and the fact that, you know, dinosaurs are, are extinct and that animals can't live for hundreds of thousands of years or anything. Um, you know, you need to have a, a, a sustainable population of yes. Ogopogos yes. or Cadborosauruses or Sasquatch or whatever they are. You're talking about a community of animals, just like any other animal that would need to be um, sustainable. So, so naturally, you know, you should be able to recover a, a body at some point, or there, there should be, they should basically pass away like, like every other living creature does and i think um finding evidence of that without you know hunt trying to hunt them yeah um hunting i think is the wrong approach there's you know a a lot of tv shows and uh um you know popular culture with people in monster trucks with shotguns and that kind of thing (laughs) that's a whole other topic 
Yeah, Bigfoot hunting for Bigfoot. Listen, I want to ask you uh, the, probably the most important question of the night in two words. Mm-hmm. William Shatner. Now, <laughs> I, I haven't seen the documentary that you did, but when you were making the documentary, did you get to work with him? Or were you a donated clip that was dropped into the production? Uh, Tell us. Well, I guess it was a little bit of both. I, um, I'm trying to remember. I don't think I signed like a NDA or anything for this. Uh, did you? Did you? Did you? Did you, did you meet uh, William Shatner? Did you? Did um, you? Did you get to call him Bill? Uh, well, I, I did refer to him as Bill during the, the time that we were making this, but no, I, uh, Bill and I never were in the same room together, unfortunately. Uh. And, uh, again, for listeners who might not be familiar, um, it was a yes, show. What's the story? Okay. It was a show called weird or what with William Shatner. <laughs> and, uh, there's been a number of these shows lately. Uh, in fact, I think Bill uh, as I refer to him, obviously. Oh, yeah, yeah, he's, you made uh, it, man. I think Bill, he's a, a colleague of mine. Bill <laughs> is involved in a number of these different shows because of <laughs> his his early work. I believe he was involved in, you know, The Twilight Zone. Yeah. And, uh, you know, a, a classic actor. Um, so he filmed his parts, I believe, it looked like at a nice house in California. I don't know if it was his house or not but uh we were talking about an incident in australia where a boat had been um capsized and these folks had set out on a uh, on a sailboat and they were sailing the boat around australia to move it to another port and the boat was seemingly attacked um but there were still valuables on board so it wasn't a pirate attack and uh, this, the, the company that was making this production with William Shatner contacted me to ask if I thought it could have been a giant squid. Hmm, really? Yeah. So, I mean, I. Um, he sought I, out your, your, your was wizened advice on the subject. Yeah, and I think I think probably through you know the BCSCC and my work, I you know I've I've really over the years of my involvement with the British Columbia Scientific Cryptozoology Club, um, it's up to each person I think up to each researcher to decide their own uh, take on a subject and to you know listen to all the different stories you hear and. Um, don't be afraid to kind of like represent your own opinion. If you're not sure on something, it's okay. Uh, because a lot of, of, you know, science is about not knowing things, you know, it's, it's good to admit that. So I've always tried to be involved in things like the, uh, you know, the Vancouver aquarium I mentioned earlier with, uh, um, Paul LeBlond. Um, I did some some presentations there and and really trying to promote, you know, um, education and and communication on the subject of these kind of creatures yeah. at a level that is not, you know, a joke. I'm a full believer in that. I'm a full believer in what you just said. So that that uh, documentary i mean it it uh, it aired i think probably on the history channel and you can still find it if you have a subscription to the history channel it's on a i think the episode is called ghost ship um mm-hmm. and i you know i i speculated i said uh, flat out you know i'm not officially a giant squid expert and i'm also not an expert on you know the uh, boating accidents or anything um but I, I provided a little bit of information about the uh, giant squid and the colossal squid and how they, you know, have been known historically to um, attack ships or, um, you know, we're, we're basically in the, the um, jurisdiction of the mythical uh, legendary kind of sea serpent and are now a recognized 
verified species. So the giant squid for me kind of represents that journey that we were just talking about that, uh, you know, a Sasquatch or a Cabrosaurus or anything else would need to take to be, you know, to become truly, you know, protected and recognized. Mm-hmm. So uh, somewhat akin to that is uh, Sasquatch. Now we know Sasquatch has hoaxers galore, and there's a special place in hell for each and every one of them. <laughs> Have the big lake serpents had hoaxers in the past? Oh, yeah, of course. I mean... <clears throat> Hoaxing is another one of these subjects, you know, hoaxing and cryptozoology. Um, it really, unfortunately, it, uh, it changes people's perception of the subject when um, something turns out to be fake. Mm -hmm. You know, if there's a, a sighting that turns out to be mm -hmm. just excitement or it happens all the time on, you know, Lake Okanagan and... Uh, Loch Ness, of course, being like the the original, you know, the original Loch Ness monster. There were um, numerous incidents of people. Uh, I think there was a famous one where a guy took an a um, it was an umbrella stand in the shape of an elephant foot. Okay, and he <laughs> stamped that umbrella stand elephant foot along the beach of. Loch Ness in Scotland oh. and then you know took pictures and claimed that Nessie was out for a you know a beach day um, and that's going back interestingly that's going back to the 1930s um, I think around you know 33 34 when interest in the Cadborosaurus and um, our our newsman Archie Wills in Victoria BC was becoming interested in Cabrosaurus. So I, I certainly think, you know, the, the excitement about the Loch Ness monster um, helped to ignite a little bit of local interest in what was going on in our waters. Oh, it's wonderful for tourism. <laughs> if, if nothing else, it's wonderful for tourism for certain. Yeah. yeah, and I mean, that's just another thing that I think we just have to acknowledge right off the bat is that uh, um, these creatures, these cryptids, uh, Ogopogo, Sasquatch, have now been kind of adopted as unofficial mascots of British sure. Columbia and um, yeah. are ha have been used in advertisements and all kinds of, of uh, sure. They're, materials. They're pets. They're pets, you know. It yeah. doesn't. It doesn't matter if you're selling uh, pipe tobacco or you're uh, an Olympic symbol or you know whatever. Uh, and and you're right. The problem is is that people normalize a very abnormal thing in these creatures when they play down like that or when they hoax or hoaxing diminishes. It diminishes people like you, me, or anybody who's really interested in the subject and spend their time and effort on this subject and uh it's it's not just a yuck yuck laugh you know it is that but uh there's a i had a conversation with thomas saying you know maybe we shouldn't take all this so seriously you know maybe it's time to have a good laugh at all of this stuff all of these cryptids and everything but i feel that uh when someone pulls a hoax People remember the hoax for years. Nobody remembers the story of someone who really believes they had an encounter. You know, that that disappears pretty fast because there's always another story following up, following it up quickly. But a hoax, the, the hoax, I mean, they're still talking about the mission hoax. And I don't know how many decades ago that was. <laughs> but no, it diminishes. It diminishes. And uh it's something that people should watch out for who are getting Absolutely. into this field. Well, I mean, it, I, it's, it really is up to everyone as an individual to decide, you know, what research you're interested in and what, uh, you know, who you're going to follow because there were, there's so many personalities in this um, arena 
And mm-hmm. there's a lot of people who are really interested in the social media aspect or promoting themselves as a media uh, expert or a regional expert on, you know, Sasquatch. That there's numerous, numerous cases, and uh, one one of which I can think of a uh, guy who's had quite a lot of success. I would say. Um, has a documentary on Netflix and um, was doing tours in Alberta for a while. And uh, um, it's, uh, you don't always want to listen to the loudest voice in the room, I guess no. is what I'm, what I'm saying. No, def- definitely not. Um, it's, I, I covered this rather extensively in the third podcast, the Sasquatch 101 part three, talking about the, uh, Sasquatch or Bigfoot community of which there is no such thing. There's just a bunch of loosely affiliated characters full of ego and some are full of lies. And, you know, you got to have your skeptical glasses on. You can't just take anyone at face value. If they got something, ask for proof to back it up. Just don't take somebody's word for anything because there are people out there who at the very least will exaggerate. That's the mildest sin, you know, exaggeration. But uh, it's a wild, woolly West out there uh, when it comes to cryptids. So, you know, keep your bar high for evidence and uh, always ask for proof of anything. So tell me, you're a VP. What are the duties of a VP in the BCSCC? <laughs> well, I mean, I, I, uh, I don't think the role is um too clearly defined obviously it's i i wish it was my full-time job i've often remarked that i i wish i could just do cryptozoology full-time and it's hard to make a living that way there's a few people in this world who have successfully made a living and usually it's through um you know blogging or videos or um books writing books and um book tours and conventions Yep, the convention <laughs> circuit, uh, certainly that's another thing that, you know, if you're new to the world of Bigfoot, then get ready to go to your first convention and then meet all kinds of interesting people. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it will not be boring. You will not be bored. Not yeah. for one second. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so. Getting back to cryptids, I try to avoid talking about the creatures themselves because I'd rather concentrate on the researcher who's researching the creature. Okay. But I have to ask you, how would you describe Cadborosaurus? Good old caddy. Should people want to keep an eye out on the lake or out on the Gulf Islands this summer? Sure. What should they be looking for? Well, so traditionally, Cadborosaurus is described as you know this classic kind of sea serpent with uh almost like a horse-like head and uh, a, a body that is either looks like a big you know a big hump or several kind of coils you know and and uh, just like ogopogo like different sighting reports have different characteristics and I think it's really important to just acknowledge that, you know, different people are going to see different th- things based on their distance and, and their, um, you know, their vision and the weather and everything. And um, there are so many different characteristics that are, are attributed to uh, Cabrosaurus, but um, a long neck and a big body in, you know, in, in big proportions, you know, 30, 40 feet are, are the basics of it. Um, and I think the the ultimate question for me as a, a researcher is, you know, we have to be aware of things like elephant seals and uh, big sea lions. And um, we even have uh, uh, basking sharks in our, our waters around quite huge yes um, quite huge and they're massive they're they're 40 mm-hmm. feet long and they yeah. were quite common in fact in the earlier days in the like the 30s and 40s um before the the fishing operations really kicked off in british columbia 
um, there you would see apparently you, you could see hundreds of basking sharks and uh, I just have to um, kind of acknowledge I, I, I think I, I kind of presented this this theory at my presentation for the Vancouver Aquarium which you can watch on YouTube by the way uh, it's called sea monsters fact or fiction mm -hmm. um, I, I I kind of ended on the note that the basking shark essentially to me fits the description of Cadborosaurus. And if people were to see something like that at the surface, especially in the thirties or forties, I think it could easily create the, you know, the kind of excitement if they didn't know what they were, what they yeah, were seeing. Sure. I mean, giant squid kraken and what have you. Yeah. Giant sharks. Yeah. Giant whale shark. <laughs> it is actually the basking shark is the second largest freshwater fish after the whale shark, which is the first large. Oh, yeah. There's okay. We we got to throw one one in for the Sasquatch crowd. They might be dozing off a little at this point. So let's turn to Harrison Lake. How many big guys like Caddy or an Ogopogo have been reported in that lake over the years? I know there have been reports. Uh, yeah, and I mean, this is um, uh, this is another interesting one where we were talking about Vancouver Island and Cameron Lake being both, uh, you know, a, a potential lake cryptid and a, a potential Sasquatch hotspot. And Harrison Lake has certainly uh, become a, a kind of like a central point. I think if you're involved in Sasquatch research in British Columbia, Harrison Lake and the surrounding area is mm -hmm. um, probably where you want to be. And there's just such a, a rich history of different sightings. And you've, you know, um, obviously your your previous podcasts, uh, John Green. A lot of that is is uh, the result of John Green and his early involvement in the subject. But uh, um, in terms of uh, uh, creatures in the water of Harrison Lake, um, I think it's also important to acknowledge Harrison Lake is connected to the ocean by way of the Harrison River and then the Fraser River. Mm -hmm. And so uh, seals can swim up through the, the river, especially if they're, you know, they're hungry and they're catching salmon. Um, and another topic that I've become very interested in is a sturgeon in the Fraser River. Yes. We have some of the largest sturgeon in the world in our river system. And every year there are uh, sturgeon caught in British Columbia that are close to 100 years old. Yep. They could weigh a thousand pounds. Um, and, you know, thinking of Harrison Lake and how deep and cold it is, um, and how close it is to the Fraser river where some of these massive sturgeon have been caught. I mean, um, I'd be really, really interested to, I know they, they do some sturgeon catch and release as part of the research program, conservation research program that you can get it involved with and uh, I've always thought it'd be interesting to get involved with that oh I think that's fascinating I mean they're living dinosaurs uh, 12 feet long is no exception you know they they grow in a monstrous size and they're from another era altogether and uh, yeah they're, they're uh, pretty fascinating and you're absolutely right if uh, if Harrison Lake is that deep who knows what might be down there you know now, speaking of Harrison, I might be wrong, but I think that Lake Lizard reports, not Harrison, but let's say for the whole southern BC, that Lake Lizard reports in cumulative numbers could give the Sasquatch reports a run for their money down here. I'm quite surprised at the number of lake and sea serpent reports that there are out there. Yeah, I mean... Um the number of different lakes in British Columbia that have a, you know, a, a lake monster tradition or a history is truly astounding. 
and um, some obviously more than others, like Lake Okanagan being a huge lake and being well, you know, populated uh, area. Uh, there are a number of other lakes, uh, like Cameron Lake on Vancouver Island, and um, uh, uh, several lakes on Vancouver Island actually that, that have different traditions. I do want to acknowledge again, you know, um, indigenous traditions around um the the lakes and sometimes i think there's a little bit of a mis misdirected attempt to um either like like uh, uh adapt those stories into something that we can we can kind of understand and interact with mm -hmm. um and then also the fact that british columbia you know some of these lakes are connected to the ocean um we have uh, uh, big fish like these these sturgeon floating around in these these lakes. So, for the number of different lakes that that uh, have a reported creature, I I would say there's probably only a small percentage that would really potentially have something that is, you know, an unknown species. Yeah, you know. I, I, I have to admit at this point that, you know, this subject excites me and I'll, I'll tell you why. What we're talking about in general here today. You know, I see CADI as an opportunity for young researchers to have an alternative cryptid or an additional cryptid for study. I think, you know, it's uh, a more reliable area of research. For one thing, unlike Sasquatch, it's uh, harder to fake signs <laughs> of Ogopogo or Caddy, you know, and uh, it's a lot more accessible to the average person. I mean, all you got to do is go to one of the big lakes and keep your eyeballs peeled and who knows what you're going to see. So, you know, I, I, I think that it excites me that way in uh, involving younger people who might be interested in this kind of thing. Uh, I mean, uh, yeah, you can always go camping, too, and try to run into a Sasquatch, but mm -hmm. I think it'd be more fun for kids for a day on the lake looking for Ogopogo. I want to ask you, did I not some years back hear a story from some uh, investigatory group about uh, Loch Ness, who'd been studying uh, Nessie for a long time, or an individual, and they threw in the towel? And they say they don't believe that Nessie exists. Now, I heard that on a okay. news program some years ago. And I'm not sure if it was just one individual or whether it was a, a, a society or whatever who were investigating Loch Ness. But uh, they finally threw in the towel and said, uh, no, they don't believe there's anything in the lock. I think you're... You, I think I know what you mean. Mm -hmm. um, there is a, a man by the name of Steve Feltham. Okay. Um, he's like a well-known kind of Nessie investigator who has spent, you know, more than 28 years kind of tracking down the the Loch Ness monster. I believe he lived on the the shore of the Loch for a number of years, and, and uh, you know, has basically devoted his whole life um, to looking for the creature over twenty years. You know, setting up cameras, and uh, he has the world record for you know a continuous kind of surveillance of the the lake, and. Uh, I, I think I believe this is who you're referring to a little while ago, who said that um, he was giving up the search. But then I'm also reading that you know he may be involved in a, a new film, a new documentary kind of short film that's coming out. So it's almost interesting to see some of these figures in cryptozoology become um, uh, cultural icons, like Rene de Hinden in his early work. Um, with the Sasquatch, as well as Lauren Coleman, actually shout out to Lauren Coleman and the International Cryptozoology Museum in in uh, Portland, Maine. Yeah, 
um, who has always been a, a subject of a voice of reason kind of on this, this subject. Um, but I, those two, I believe, were the inspiration for John Lithgow's character in Harry and the Henderson. Harry and the Henderson, yeah. <laughs> you know, I think that the Pacific Northwest gives Sasquatch uh, a pretty good place to hide from the masses. But on the subject we're talking about, I would think that the world covered with, you know, two thirds with ocean would give Cadborosaurus, you know, a really good place to spend the rest of their lives in solitude. You know, the ocean is pretty deep. There are creatures down there, I'm sure, that have not even been dreamt of yet that never make it to the surface. Uh, uh, why do you think that these creatures less, live most of their life at sea? I mean, like they're like salmon. They only come in to visit every now and then, Cadborosaurus and uh, Nessie or what have you. Do they use the ocean as a pretty nifty hiding place? You know, that's an interesting question, Jerry. Um, uh, I think it relates to what I was saying earlier about, you know, if you have a, a real population of these creatures, mm -hmm. you need to have a, a sustainable population and they need to be able to reproduce. And that cycle for a lot of animals means, you know, um, going from freshwater to salt water, like, a, you know, um, there's plenty of fish um, that do that. And um, even the, the, uh, the sturgeons and things and, and things like catfish, as well, um, quite common in the in the UK. Um, I think it's absolutely possible that there are animals that are are swimming from the ocean into freshwater and are being seen where they're not expected to be seen. Yeah, and that that can create a number of you know, obviously confusion and, and sometimes, you know, false identification of, uh, of a creature. Like in, in the case of Harrison Lake, for example, I think, uh, you know, I was talking about the seals and sturgeons and all kinds of different things that could, could potentially be in there. But there's no reason why a, like an unidentified creature um, couldn't also be um, able to adapt from freshwater to salt water. Mm, that's interesting. Yeah. Of all the cryptids, would you say that Cadborosaurus is the most plausible of all the cryptids uh, in uh, BC? All would the cryptids say? in BC? Yeah. yeah. I mean, I would not these, say that. these types of cr creatures were th there before, you know, like the Plesiosaurus and such, and they're all documented through fossils and uh, what have you. Uh, so did they ever go away? I mean, did all of the dinosaurs ever go away? Or uh, is, is this something new, this Cadborosaurus? I think that's a, that's a good question, Jerry. And it, um, it goes back to, you know, the Loch Ness Monster and that classic image that people think of when they, when they think of the Loch Ness Monster, you think of this long necked, uh, use the term plesiosaur or mosasaur, elasmosaur. Mm -hmm. There's a number of these dinosaurs that are, are basically long necked swimming reptiles that have essentially become a stand in for the, you know, image or idea of a lake monster or sea serpent for, for a lot of people. And I think um, you know, there's tons of different reasons for that, like Jurassic Park and, um, even the in the early days of like the 1930s and people were learning about dinosaurs and and uh you know what you think of a giant swimming creature you know naturally mm -hmm. yeah you're gonna put two and two together but to have a realistic kind of scientific discussion about it we have to acknowledge that dinosaurs are extinct um I, I don't see it as a possibility that there is a, a surviving population of plesiosaurs or mosasaurs or any of those prehistoric creatures um, without, you know, we, we can't really speculate on that without 
enough further evidence. And there have, you know, there's some exciting stuff with Cabrasaurus uh, footage from Alaska where it seems like many, several creatures were spotted together and that's, you know, getting into population territory, but we just, we just don't know enough. Um, Yeah. Yeah. It's not enough there to make a case. I think uh, in terms of, you know, the most likely possible uh, cryptid, I mean, the Sasquatch in British Columbia, um, forget about, you know, worldwide and other places where the Sasquatch has been been seen. I think for me, why I became fascinated with, you know, the stories and the history of the subject of Sasquatch in British Columbia is because it seems so plausible and... Um, I think it's really, really important to have, you know, uh, skeptical goggles on and be using all of the, the modern kind of techniques of research and investigation, which you're looking into, especially older stories in BC about, you know, uh, Sasquatch encounters. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. But when you start to, you know, if you start to read the books, and of course, John Green is, is you know, probably the, the best place to start with it and start to, you know, familiarize yourself with the accounts. The more accounts you read, the more you start to think, you know, there's there's got to be something here. There's something to this. And one question, the probably the trickiest question somebody ever asked me about cryptozoology was if the Patterson-Gimlin film was imagine hypothetically if the Patterson Gimlin film turned out to be a fake, turned out to be a hoax, would you still believe in Sasquatch in other areas, like in British Columbia? <laughs> like if we didn't basically, if we didn't have the Patterson Gimlin film from Bluff Creek, California, and um, you know everybody knows what I mean by that. Yeah. Imagine that piece of evidence never existed. Where would we be at with Sasquatch and British Columbia, Jerry? Well, you know, uh, I can only speak for myself on that. And, you know, that the, pa- the Patterson Gimlin film never made it or broke it for me one way or the other. Uh, wh- what hooked me really was uh, René de Hinden's book. And uh, that, that he wrote with Don Hunter, I believe his name was, and um, John Green's books, of course, which uh, followed after that. And um, I just thought, you know, it's just possible. It's just possible. So many people have claimed to have seen these creatures that, you know, isn't it worth uh, looking into? And if you're wrong, you're wrong. The world doesn't come to an end. But I, I can tell you honestly right now that even if it's proven tomorrow that uh, such a creature never existed, never will exist, it wouldn't bother me one bit. You know, at least now the mystery is solved and uh, on, on, on to something else kind of thing. Mm-hmm. I, w- I wouldn't lament it for very long because, you know, our world is pretty small when it comes to travel methods and communications and stuff like that but it's still a big earth in mass just in size so i don't know what do you think adam still more cryptids you know out there to be revealed yet absolutely i mean i i i think fundamentally an interest in this topic means an interest in the natural world and the world around you, uh, you know, uh, animals and mysterious creatures. I think it's one of the oldest interests probably is what is out there, you know, in the, the dark or what's making that noise, you know, yeah. it's really almost primal, I think is what draws a lot of people to it. And, you know, you, you could get the opportunity to go up into the, the region around Harrison Lake and sit around a campfire and, you know, um, for me, it's it's can be restorative, yes. you know, and think about it like, you know, uh, traveling into nature and, you know, enjoying that time in nature and not about trying to capture or, Absolutely. or you know, defeat uh, or anything like that. As I said, often, I've often said that, you, you know, you'll never regret the time you spent 
back in the backwoods. You won't regret it. You know, I, I camp a lot at Harrison. I ATV a lot at Harrison. Mm -hmm. And I have to tell you, going back to what you say about the campfire, when that campfire is going at 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock at night, there's a part of you with your ear cocked to the distance to see if there's any strange vocalizations or anything. Sure. <laughs> it's there. It's and there. And, you know, the best times I ever had were on the trail uh, with, uh, with the UTVs, with uh, uh, Thomas Steenberg and Bill Miller and who yeah. have you. They were the best times of my life. I never regretted it for a moment. And Barry Blunt, can't forget Barry. Mm -hmm. I never regretted it for a moment. Even, and even if it's all fake tomorrow, I had good times. I had good times. So tell me, Adam, where do you see the BCSCC going in the future? Uh, well, I mean, I, I, um, I know John is a, as dedicated as can be. I mean, his work... Um, really, the, the BCSCC quarterly newsletter is John's uh, baby and has been for years, and I think is probably the longest running cryptozoology publication now, because there were a few, like you touched on the International Society of Cryptozoology, there's been a couple pop-up kind of newsletters here and there, but the BCSCC quarterly, um, I believe he has the entire archives as well. Uh, and again, it speaks to that really detail oriented, you know, it's great when people in cryptozoology are, have all their facts and, and figures in a, in a row, um, which John generally does. <laughs> so, I mean, obviously, um, when you're getting interested in this stuff, you have to make a distinction between doing research, you know, academically and through you know, it's okay to watch documentaries and make up your mind about them and, and read different books and then going to, you know, an actual lake like Lake Okanagan or going to um, Harrison Lake and spending time out in the field and doing field work. And I think a lot of people, you know, when they hear about the BCSCC, they expect a, uh, you know, a, a maybe a more formal organization uh -huh. or, you uh, you know, more formalized field trips. Yes. Um, but it's really more of a, you know, a network of like-minded kind of individuals that um, work together sometimes or go out, sometimes go out in the, in the field with one another and sometimes share information. And there's a lot of politics around, you know, um, the latest kind of citing reports and where they, they've happened and how you can, can find out about that. So it's, um, I think there's been so much interest in recent years because of, you know, there's uh, shows and uh, Bigfoot is everywhere lately, but you can't, um, you can't learn everything about this topic overnight or no. even over a few years. And you can't, um, you can't barge your way into a the kind of like the, the community of the people who have been been working for a long time, um, 10, 15 years, or uh, especially indigenous communities, um, it, can, it, it can really kind of put people off, I yeah. think, the subject mm -hmm. if people are being, you know, uh, disrespectful or not, not acknowledging that, you know, there's a lot of history in this, this subject. Oh, for sure, for sure. And every, everything that you said tonight, you, well, you had a lot of comments that were very insightful, I must admit. And, uh, you know, I'm really, I'm really glad that uh, we had a chance to do this today, and I look forward to doing it again. You know, as you listeners may or may not know, this podcast is based on Barbara Wasson's wonderful book, Sasquatch Apparitions which she published back in 1971. Uh, Barbara's not with us anymore. She passed away. But in, in, in this book, she wrote about the researchers of the day and how their passions affected each of their lives to various degrees, whether, you know, it's Bob Titna she's talking about or the Four Horsemen, uh, you know, Thomas Steinberg. She knew all of them and all of them knew her, you know. So it's my wish to carry on the idea of that book 
by recording conversations with researchers of this current day. I think that these people are as equally amazing as the creatures that they search for, if not more so. And I think we proved it today by having Adam McGreer on with us. And uh, man, knocked it out of the park, Adam. Great show. Thanks, Jerry. Um, thanks for, for having me. It's Okay, dear listener, that about wraps it up for now. My name is Jerry Matthews. You can reach me at yellowcoyote at talus.net. Thank you for your interest. And until the next time, keep searching. Keep searching.